Hey, this is Grady from Anxious, and you're listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The New Scene. This is Keith. And Tommy. And we're back with another brand new episode. And folks, we've got a big one on the show tonight. We've been working on it for a while, and it's here. Walter Schreifels of Quicksand. Excellent discussion coming up. Strap yourselves in. We talk about Quicksand. We talk about old school New York hardcore. We talk about rival schools. We talk about walk-in concert. We talk about the latest Quicksand albums, Interiors and Distant Populations. As we said to Walter, Tommy, I've grown up listening to him. I started a band that sounded just like Quicksand because I like Quicksand so much. <laughs> I mean, well, it ended up sounding a little different, but I'm excited for everybody to hear this, and it was great to talk to Walter. Yeah, this was really like a kind of dream interview in terms of like, I've listened to Quicksand since my sister gave me um, Slip when I was in seventh grade, I think, sixth grade maybe. And it's been in constant rotation ever since. And it's just become part of the canon of what I think, just what good music sounds like. I I, I constantly go away from the term of like heavier music. Cause the Quicksand is just great music. You can play that for somebody that likes tool or you know radio rock and they're gonna be like wow this is pretty good i like this and you could play it for someone that's into you know super duper heavy music like they're a big like you know cannibal corpse fan or something they'll be like all right i could kind of dig this they run the gamut and they are have such wide appeal and I, i just love everything about them absolutely and the body of walter's work is pretty eclectic you've got Youth of Today, Gorilla Biscuits, Quicksand, Rival Schools, Walking Concert, Vanishing Life, Dead Heavens, the solo albums. He's done it all. He's literally done it all. And he wrote that whole Civ album, right? I think, yeah, I think, I think that, he that wrote too. wrote that whole damn thing. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I, someone told me that at one point. I hope it's true. <laughs> <laughs> we're just repeating things now at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, we're excited for you to hear the Walter conversation that's coming up. I remember, Tommy... I played w- Crash of 64 was my band with Pat from All Else Failed that, oh, yeah. you know, we just wanted to sound a lot like Quicksand. And we actually got to play a gig with Rival Schools at the Note in Westchester. And, you know, after we played, I, I remember talking to Walter for a second. I was like, hey, man, uh, I think you're great. You know, we started this band just because we love Quicksand so much and wanted to sound like you guys and whatever. And he's like, oh, well, you guys took it to the next level. And I was like, no, we didn't. But thank you for saying that. <laughs> You're a very kind person. Thank you. <laughs> I still have that on my iPod. The Crash of 64. Crash of 64? Yeah, the demo that you sent me. Yep. I think it's solid. I think it's solid too. All right. So let's get down to brass tacks here. Now, folks, look, I'm going to level with all of you. I'm laying myself out here. I'm being honest. We need your help. We need your help. We need your support. So here's what I need you to do. If you like the show... If you like what you hear, open up your Apple Podcasts app on your phone. Click on the new scene, okay? Scroll down until you see the ratings and reviews section and give us a five-star review. I'm begging you, please. We need them. We need them. We need a lot of five-star reviews. Now, I see how many of you listen to the show, and it's a very healthy number. That number is not reflected in the ratings. We need your support. The ratings help us out. They help us in podcast standings. So if you like the show, give us a five-star review. Simple as that. And look, you don't even have to write a review if you don't want. If you want to, we would love it because we read them on the air and it's fun. But give us the five-star review. I'm begging you. I'm begging you. That's like, uh, this is like when NPR comes on like three times a year and they're like, yes, we know that you, (laughs) we know that you enjoy the programming here at WHYY. However, listener support is about you. This is, this is our, our call to arms, please. (laughs) This is our listener support moment. We really need your support. And look, we don't charge for content. We don't have a Patreon because in all honesty, if we did that, 
whatever we put on the Patreon wouldn't be as good as the main show. And we do the main show every week. There's so much work that goes into it from the editing to the mixing, to piecing it all together and posting it every single week. We don't ask for much, but we are asking for this and one more thing, which I'm going to get to in a second. So folks, open the Apple Podcast app, scroll down to ratings and reviews and give us a five-star rating. Also in Spotify, you can rate now too. Yeah, so search out the new scene in Spotify. Right when you go there in the top, you'll see a rating system in the left. Give us five stars. I can see that some of you have done it already. Please, it helps us out a lot, and we appreciate it. And there's one more thing I'm going to beg for, folks, and here it comes. We have shirts. We have shirts available for pre-order now. Please pre-order them. They're very, very attractive shirts. Right, Tommy? You've seen it. I love them. Yeah. Even if I wasn't a fan of this show or on this show, I would buy that shirt. I like the graphic. I like the way it looks. Everything about the aesthetic is nice. I just enjoy it. Exactly. Exactly. So the shirt is up for pre-order. Now, this shirt is the number one way you can support us right now. Because as I mentioned a few moments ago, we don't ask for any money. It costs us money to put on the show every month. A lot of money, a lot of effort, a lot of time. But if you purchase this shirt, this can really help us out. You know, This is the number one way to support us right now. So go to our Instagram or our Twitter. The link is in the bio. It's the iodine store at Deathwish Inc. So you go to Deathwish Inc., You click store, search the new scene, and the shirt will pop right up. Please order the shirt. I'm begging you. I'm I'm on my knees right now, begging you. I mean, I hate begging, but at the same time, it's like, we need this type of support. This is the type of support that keeps the show going. It's the thing that keeps us in terms of like, this show isn't cheap to produce. It is time consuming. It is a lot of work. And we really need to make sure that, you know, we do this out of, this is a labor of love. We really do love doing it. But at the same time, we really need to make sure that we're putting all this effort into it. We would definitely like to see more people express how they feel about the show. And on top of that, those expressions help us in terms of the algorithm. It helps us get seen more by other people. And it it definitely increases our exposure. So do us a favor, please. Very well put, Tommy. And, you know, if you and I are both begging, I think it'll work better. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's, a, it's a tandem thing. It's like uh, you you walk into the grocery store and there's like somebody that's like, hey, can you sign this thing about, hey, we want to make sure we stop child labor. And no, OK, OK. And then they just hit you on the inside, too. After that second person, you're like, oh, my God, I'll just sign it. What do you got? Yeah. And look, look Tommy has a family. He has three children. He has a wife. Let's be honest, like, I'll be okay. I can make it work. You know, I'll do what I got to do. But Tommy has four people to care for. And everything is riding on people ordering this shirt. So if you don't order the shirt, Tommy will end up homeless. And starving. Yeah, and starving. And nobody wants nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. I've already turned the heat off in the house. Oh. And it's been so cold. We got hit with a snowstorm. Folks, look what you're doing to poor Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. But yeah, no, it really does help us out. And I think one of the things is if you do, if you listen to the show and you enjoy it, just share your enjoyment with other people. It only really takes you a couple minutes to go on there, hit that voice to text, write some stuff about us that's nice, and then go on your merry way and then feel like good for the rest of the day, like you helped us out. There you go. And in music news, Audio Karate has a new song, new video out, Lovely Residence, featuring Agent M, a.k.a. Emily Whitehurst. It's a great song. I've listened to it multiple times today, so if you're a fan of more pop-punk-sounding bands, this is really, really, really quality stuff. Check it out. They've got a pre-order up at Iodine Recordings. It's a collection of their rare and unreleased material called Otra, and it was produced by, ready for this, Tommy, it was produced by Bill Stevenson of The Descendants and Trevor Keith of Face to Face. Oh, I love Face to Face. The pre-order is up now at Iodine Recordings. Go check it out. But I really dig the song. I really dig the song. It's awesome. I, I love Audio Karate. They're super fun, super good poppy music. And if you have kids like I do, great music to put on in the car with the kids. It really is something you can sing along to it. It's fun. It's energetic. And on top of that, 
it's just it it's a very melodic kind of thing. I don't have to have my daughters be like, turn it down. So <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Oh, there's a new Meshuggah song. Wait, for real? The Abysmal Eye, yes. Oh my goodness. I didn't even know. How is it? Fucking awesome. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. And the album is called Immutable, which if you're not a vocabulary nerd like myself, which means over time, it's an unchanging thing, which is just testament to the fact that Meshuggah's like, fuck you, we're doing the same fucking style, and it's going to be the exact same shit, and it's going to be fucking heavier and better. There we go. Yeah, they their sound doesn't change too much, per se. I would just say it gets stronger and stronger with each album, and I get into serious, serious Meshuggah jags where I listen to them a ton. Have you looked on, have you watched on YouTube the Meshuggah at 20% slower speed ones? No. Uh, I think they have. (laughs) I think Meshuggah's been listening to it because it's, it's, there's some parts that I was like, this sounds like Chaos Fear slightly slowed down, but it's really, really good. Um, Yeah. The new track is called The Abysmal Eye and it is from the upcoming album Immutable. I am going to listen to that immediately. Immediately. Okay, so that's it for this segment, folks. Enough talk, enough begging. We are now going to speak to Walter Schreifels. Enjoy. All right, folks, we're here now with Walter Schreifels. Walter, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks a lot. It's like to be here. It's great to have you here. Uh, so, Walter, how are you doing today? Today has been a good day. Um, nice, relaxing Sunday. Uh, I, I'm training for uh, for the Brooklyn Marathon in April, and today was my first long run. And um, I was dreading it, but in the end, it went well. So I'm feeling good. I was. Oh, how long did you run today? That was my question. <laughs> today was nine and a half miles, and I was only supposed to run nine. So, like, if that tells you anything, I'm just like feeling it today. Although it was, it was, I was slow and. Um, not really stoked on how cold it it is out and like i wore too much clothes and so then i was in the beginning like warm and then too warm and um so anyway we could i could do a whole podcast just talking about my run this morning but let's just suffice to say it went well (laughs) walter let's take it back a little bit and get to know you where did you grow up uh for the most part i grew up in rockaway beach in queens And I also lived in State College, Pennsylvania, when my parents were going to school for a while. And then I moved back and lived in Astoria, Queens, for like high school time. Wow. So you've you've done it all, the rural and the city. Yes. Oh, and I also lived in um, Toledo, Ohio in uh, sophomore year, which was really fun too. So yeah, I got the Midwest in, I got the rural vibes and, uh, you know, I grew up next to a beach for, for most of my, you know, childhood. And, uh, and so, yeah, I kind of have a, I appreciate, you know, all these different kind of ways of doing it. Growing up in Rockaway must've been interesting because, you know, I live in Brooklyn and even when we go out to Rockaway and Jay Reese beach and all that, the people look at you like you're not even from New York. Yeah. I mean, Rockaway is a trip. I mean, it's very, um, Bell Harbor, which is is kind of the area. Well, Nuponsa, it's right next to to Reese Park, but it's it's a very you know it's kind of like it's a peninsula, but it's also an island. You know, in a way, because you're isolated from the rest of the city. So uh, it's uh, it's wonderful though. Living near the beach is just you know, I mean, I I guess I kind of just took it as a as a fact when I was little, but, um, it, it's a magical thing. I mean, the ocean's incredible and to, to like look out at the city and, you know, you could see, you know, empire state building and the skyline of the city, uh, from Rockway, but yet you're in this totally other world. I, I, you know, feel, feel very blessed for that. And, uh, Rockway now is like so much more, yeah, like kind of, developed and hipstery and i love it so much uh it was something else when i was when i was little but um but it's just incredible to have like a beach in in new york city it's great yeah that's what i like most about this city it's like you can get on the subway and you can go to mountains Mm -hmm. uh if you take the regional rail or or you can get on a subway and go to the beach i mean we have it all it's it's such a new york i mean 
It's the best. It's it's incredible. The absolute best. So tell us about your history with music. Have you always been interested in music your whole life? I definitely, I feel there was a a natural, you know, all kids love music, I think. And, uh, but I really got into it more so when uh, I saw the movie Yellow Submarine. And that really blew my mind, you know, uh, the, the animation and the music and, and how the, the songs just, you know, it, it just really kind of struck me a bit harder. And, uh, you know, and then I kind of rated my parents record collections and found, uh, cool stuff. And then, you know, I had cousins that turned me on to, to music and it just seemed like a world where you could, you know, as time went by, like, uh, you know, that it's, you know, you, you really can transport yourself through music and, and, uh, you know, be in another place. And, uh, that was always appealing to me. And, you know, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm a music lover and eventually I figured out how to play guitar, which is probably one of my great life accomplishments to like actually learn how to do it. And, um, you know, that kind of got me, you know, under the hood of it all, but it's still magical and, you know, uh, mysterious and, uh, you know, and, and, and interesting to me, like listening to it, finding new music and, you know, uh, you know, experimenting with my own music and, and, you know, trying to, you know, widen my scope and, and challenge myself. It, it's just like sort of a, a really wonderful lifelong pursuit um, that is both active and passive. A hundred percent. I love one of my favorite natural highs is discovering a new band where you get that hit. You know what I mean? Like, what is this? I seek that out all the time. Yeah. And, you know, and it's out there. So, and it's, and it's interesting, like how it just sort of, I mean, I'm, I really am knocked out by how, when I'm listening to, you know, I have Spotify account and just how much music I've discovered through Spotify that just songs that I was like alive when these songs were made and I never heard them and they're incredible. Uh, you know, it just seems like an endless supply of, of songs from, from all time that, uh, you know, are inspiring and, and get me psyched and, you know, kind of, uh, digging into different genres and, and, you know, finding yourself, you know, going deeper and deeper out into, into the, the ocean of music and, and how much there is. And just, it, it, it's just so deep and vast. And, uh, I do get a thrill when I find something new or unexpected that is, you know, speaking to me, you know, which is, uh, it, it it just it's really cool. When's the last time that happened? When you heard a band randomly and you were like, "Oh, what is this?" Shit, I'd have to look at my phone today. But like, you know, stuff that'll come. Like, I'm sure I've listened to something today that I'm just, you know, I'll kind of like randomly. I mean, this is just modern times, but you know, I'll I'll just like a song if it comes up on you know my discovery or something like that, and then it'll pop up later. And, uh, like for example, today I'm just thinking bad, bad, not good, for example, uh, which is a band that do, they've done a lot of collaborations with, um, hip hop artists, but, um, I'm kind of into this one record of theirs, which I can't can't remember the the name of the record, but it's just like amazing, like jazz influenced, uh, live music with like just incredible musicians, you know, I'm, I guess I'm more known for this sort of like more like on the punk or heavy side of things in a way. And of course, like I love that kind of music, but, you know, band like Bad, Bad, Not Good, like I, you know, a lot of it's instrumental music and, and jazz influenced. And that's just sort of like, I appreciate that kind of, you, you know, music as a genre, but like to really, you know, feel it is, is, is awesome. And then I, you know, as a musician, I take that influence and you know i'm not even necessarily consciously but it kind of gets into my head of like you know i start to regurgitate it so it it, but in my own way so it's 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 really exciting to discover new things like that and to you know when you were like forming your musical taste or whatever you had certain ideas of what your limits were what your comfort zone was and then you know you find out that you like more than you thought. And I, I, I get hungry for that, you know? So it, it, it's, it hasn't that, that kind of 
quest has not ended for me. And uh, I, I think that that's, you know, that's great. Absolutely. And, you know, you've been involved with so many different kinds of bands. You're very eclectic, Walter. And I'm going to get into all that. But first, let me say, I hear what you're saying. Like, my thing used to be, oh, if I'm starting a band, I want to sound like this band. I just want to sound like this band. And I, from talking to so many musicians on this show and just growing older and getting wiser, I've realized it's about incorporating different elements from so many different kinds of music and not just trying to sound like one band. Like I'll listen to a band completely out of the genre I'm working in and be like, oh, that's really cool. Let me try to work that into what I'm doing. And that's when you really come up with some creative stuff. For sure. Is that that cross pollinization? I mean, if you're just doing a band that sounds like just like another band, then unless there's like a lot of time passing between your band and that band, you know, you're just going to be kind of a second rate version. It's like how you incorporate other elements. And I think generally like it's going to be most interesting when you uh, are just sort of regurgitating is in, in a natural way that that is your own personal touch. Cause you know, everybody has that unique you know, way of doing things. Everyone has their way that they walk, the way that they talk. And, you know, especially if you're in a band situation where it's collaborative, it's like, then the chemistry starts to play a part. You know what I mean? Like you might be really into this one thing, but your, you know, your bandmate might be into something that you're not really as familiar with, you know what I mean? And, and that sort of blend is what makes things exciting you know uh and and you know and if you're you're go f the further i think you go out on a limb uh with those uh with that exploration i think that's when you can really make something interesting that that stands out a hundred percent so how did you decide you wanted to start playing um in bands in bands well i i guess i just at i couldn't really define a moment but i guess there was a certain point where i just thought being in bands was cool you know um I remember seeing um, the uh, the Ramones movie Rock and Roll High School, and just seeing the you know I, I went I went to see a double feature with my cousin who was older and uh, with Kids Are All Right and uh, Rock and Roll High School, uh, and I didn't I knew who the Who were, but I didn't know who the Ramones were at all. But in that one day of watching this double feature of the Who and the Ramones. Uh, I was like, I want to be in that world, you know, somewhere, you know, in the 1960s or in the, 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 the punk, whatever the, the world is that the Ramones lived in. And, um, so, you know, learning to play guitar, uh, that just kind of worked out for me. Uh, there was a, a guitar teacher that a friend of mine was taking guitar lessons and they were only $5 a lesson. So I took like my Christmas money and, you know, $35 and got some guitar lessons. And, uh, that was kind of enough to, you know, figure out back and black and a few other songs and kind of get started in, in playing guitar. And then, you know, once you know how to play guitar, it's like, you know, it's like skateboarding in a way you're like with your friends, you're practicing, you're making mistakes, you're working towards, I mean, I guess it's different from skateboarding because it's more of like a group goal, but at the same time, you're like, you know, finding what your skills are, you know, what, what, or, or what your, what part of, of this pursuit is the most exciting and thrilling to you. And, and, you know, and you go from there and, and to be honest, like I, it, I'm still on that journey. Like it, it's not, uh, you know, there's, there's no destination, final destination to it. And it's just a, a practice, you know, and, um, and, it, you know, as you, as you go through life, like, you know, when I was a teenager, it was just like a cool thing to do that I was interested in. But as I am, you know, sitting here talking with you now, I'm like, holy shit, you know, like in some ways I'm like amazingly better than I was then. And in, and in other ways, like I haven't really gone very far. So like it, it's, uh, it, it's endlessly sort of interesting. Yeah. It's an ever changing process. And that's one thing I like about you is you've done so many different types of bands, you know, you're not just tied into one specific thing. Yeah. I mean, my influences are always different, you know? So I, I kind of want to like, I, I guess keep, come, keep saying the word regurgitation, which is like vomiting or like baby birding, <laughs> but like, it is really like that. You take, you take something in, you think it's cool. And then you just kind of want to spit out your own version. So I'm just like, not, I became obsessed with certain kinds of 
certain bands or certain genres, but then, it, you know, it's not like that isn't still a part of my story, but it's like, it's never a, enough to just be like in a certain genre or a certain sort of room within the, the realm of music, because music is a reflection of like all of us and all of our, you know, uh, you know, different ways of doing things. It's, it's sort of like, it's a big, beautiful world. Walter, did you find that uh, through skateboarding, you found different types of music as well? Um, I think I found skateboarding through music more the, that way. Like I was not, not good. At, I mean, I referenced skateboarding because it sort of connected to the music world that I'm involved in, but I was always a shitty skateboarder. I wasn't good, but I did relate to like, the sort of lifestyle-ness of it and how it connected to punk and hardcore. And I think without thinking of it in and of itself, like what skateboarding is about, but it's basically like the similarities are like you're working on something with your friends and, and it's creative and it requires practice and fucking up. And, you know, and, and I think in that way, um, and, and especially when I first started skateboarding, which was around the same time that I started playing guitar, you know, they, they were, they weren't like career paths ever for me. It was just like a pursuit, you know, and, and they were kind of like wild and free, relatively speaking to like, you know, I mean, the kind of music that I was into playing was not commercial music and skateboarding was just like, you know, I mean, now it's like a huge business, of course, but and but at that time it was a little bit more like cottage industry, I, I guess. Uh, but I think there's something, there's some linkage there, especially when it comes to like punk music. So like, yeah, I got into like, I was more psyched on JFA because of skateboarding. I was more psyched on like the faction or um, just the idea of skateboarding as a component to this like lifestyle you know because I, I wasn't a musician really at that point so it was just like doing shit that related to being hardcore or punk or whatever and skateboarding was was you know kind of a, a major thing tell us about your introduction to punk and hardcore where was your entry point how did you discover it all well the first was the that ramones movie because uh you know there was just like no I didn't know who the Ramones were. It was like no precedent for that. It just like bowled me over, like that there was this world. Uh, you know, I'd probably heard of the Sex Pistols, you know, at that point. Uh, but getting into hardcore, I think I was probably like 13 or, yeah, around 13. And there was a, a station out in Long Island uh, that played hardcore. They played a lot of cool, like British imports and things that they would play in California, but not in New York. So it's the same place that I discovered like the Smiths when they first came out or, you know, Echo and the Bunnymen and these sort of things that you're more like, you know, Buzzcocks, like new wavy kind of things. But they had a specialty show called the Midnight Riot. And um, it was on like Sunday or Saturday night at like midnight. I guess it was, you know, it was probably Saturday. And I just stumbled upon it and, uh, and you know, heard uh, the intro to uh, – Shit, I'm not sure if it was like urban waste, uh, police brutality, or it might have been uh, Holiday in Cambodia. But anyway, either one of them, it just like blew my mind that there was something – like by that time I'd heard the Ramones, but that there was something like faster and more primitive than the Ramones. And so I just you know pressed play and record on my, um, my boom box, whatever, and um, – and recorded the show. And so then I tuned in the following week and I would just like listen to this show. And at that time, you know, there wasn't that many records, I guess, relatively speaking. So, you know, I was listening to the Beastie Boys, hardcore stuff, you know, Urban Waste, all these early New York singles, but also like they would play GBH, uh, Motorhead, um, the Freeze, like just like a good rounded group of these like punk bands that to me were all like, hearing them for the first time, like, okay, like you just heard the freeze now listen to anti nowhere league. And like your mind's just getting, you're just getting blown away left and right. You know, e each song that's coming in is just like, to me, like, you know, I would, before that I would be like reading Rolling Stone, you know, to see what got good reviews. So I was like into like REM or, or U2, um, 
things like that that got that were cool that got good, really good reviews but this hardcore stuff was just like totally um void of of like this sort of musicianship or like any like the the quality the, of of recording it was just low on quality and more it and especially as a new guitar player seemed more accessible like i could do this shit you know what i mean like it's not that far off like listening to echo and the bunny man or rem they got some sort of skill or or you know um point of view whereas the, the 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 punk stuff just seemed like just more accessible and so anyway that that was just like a, a lucky stumbling onto it um but i i was living in rockaway like i wasn't going to shows when i was 13 because it was i couldn't get to the city and get home without you know my mom finding out about it and um so that didn't happen until uh, a little bit later when i moved to astoria which is uh is closer to Manhattan, which was, I guess, when I was around 15 or 16. Yeah, and, and talk about that a little bit, because you came up in a pivotal time in New York hardcore, and of course, you were involved with Youth of Today and Gorilla Biscuits, so I'm sure you're going to shows at CB's, and New York City is crazy and exciting at the time. Set the stage for us a little bit. Yeah, I think in in the, the musical side of it, I mean, and, and actually in all ways, New York, it was a very pivotal time in like the late 80s. There's a sort of like, sort of the end of that kind of like 1970s, like depopulated, you know, f- for lack of a better word, like, you know, sort of fucked up, like vision of New York as this like dangerous place. And they were trying to like, you know, turn that around with like, you know, you hear the word gentrification. That was like the first time that I had heard that expression. Uh, so the Lower East Side was still dangerous and banged up. And, you know, there was all that kind of like, you know, abandoned lots and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the idea was to make it nicer, I guess. So, and I think with like CBs and the punk scene, the time that I got there was also pivotal in the sense that I think that that those early bands like, Beastie Boys and Urban Waste and, you know, even Agnostic Front, who were still playing, were kind of like past that first wave of of excitement and were like looking for something else to do, like a larger audience or, you know, with the Beastie Boys, they started doing hip hop. Uh, With Agnostic Front, they started playing more metal style things and Urban Waste, I think, broke up. But you know what I mean? Like all these bands like were either breaking up or changing their style because it had sort of run its course. And, you know, I arrived and wanted to see Minor Threat. And Minor Threat, I found out, had already broken up. So all those first wave wave bands had kind of died out. So there really wasn't a whole lot there besides the sort of metal crossover stuff, which was not, not to knock it, but that's not what I was there for. So, um, oh, Mimi, you shush. Everything's cool. My dog's doing her dog job, you know, protecting the house. But anyway, um, hanging around for a minute, uh, some things started to emerge. One big thing was uh, Youth of Today, which um, were kind of aping the sounds of uh, of these kind of like 82, 83 era hardcore bands, you know, with these cool mosh parts. And uh, the lyrics were just a little bit more... Um, to the point and simplistic and the look was very easy to get and straight edge. Like, you know, to me, I was like, yeah, I had missed minor threat, but maybe this is like my minor threat. And, um, so, and they were just great and exciting. So I think that kind of like lit a fuse in New York city, uh, where, you know, not all the bands were straight edge, but, um, but a bit of a return to the idea of like old school hardcore, which by old school at that point, you're talking about two years prior, you know, it was 1985 and you're looking back to 1983, you know, so, uh, you know, it it wasn't that long before. Um, So, and that became honestly, like I've never experienced anything like that. I mean, maybe it was the age I was at, but um, to have all these different, kids you know my peers all coming up with these cool bands and you know every weekend there'd be like four bands at cbs that were you know maybe there'd be someone from out of town but generally it was the local bands that were so good eventually you didn't care about the out-of-town bands it was all about your peers and they would you know you'd go to the shows and 
you'd see a band and they'd come with a new song and you'd be like, damn, that new song's great. You know, they have a sick mosh part and it was all happening every weekend, you know, this like growth. And as each band got a little bit better, you know, they helped the other bands because the other bands would want to get to that level. So it was, it was a very healthy, you know, ecosystem. And uh, I was lucky to just kind of like, you know, as I was saying before, like when I first showed up at CB's, I felt like I had sort of missed the fun. But, you know, as I hung in there, I started to realize like, wow, something new is happening. And it was very exciting. Yeah. I mean, look at any one of those shows. I'm sure if you look at any flyer from that time, every band on it is going to be classic. So many of them. I mean, and, you know, and what's interesting, what I find now is that bands at the time that I didn't even really rate necessarily uh over time have found an audience by just being within that you know on the flyers so people give them a second listen and you know even myself like i didn't think they were that great then i listened to it i'm like shit actually i i should have gave them a more of a chance you know because they were you know that it was just like all these kids just kind of jumping onto the same thing but coming up with such interesting and original spins on this idea of hardcore which you know, I think as time goes by, what I've realized is that it's it's really just such a loose definition of like what hardcore is. It's like, you know, it's more about the motivation, you know, and uh, behind it, you know, and the idea of just taking it upon yourself to like create something with your friends. And, you know, it's not like a, a career choice. It's just like a, a reflection of, of your, your feelings and your friend group. And, um, you know, the sort of DIY, you know, aesthetic is about like, you're not waiting for like a record company or some like kind of like adult to tell you that this was how to do it. You know what I mean? And I think that that's an amazing thing to experience at that age. But, but I, I, I've honestly taken that throughout my life. You know what I mean? You don't need permission, you know, to, to pursue your, you know, creative ideas or, or, you know, whatever you, you might want to pursue. And, um, so we were really getting that at a young age and, and I was happened to be like fit in amongst a, a really awesome and diverse group of people that, that I think like is a reason that it continues to resonate. A hundred percent. And, uh, well, let's jump ahead a bit. So with youth of today and gorilla biscuits, it's a uh, New York hardcore straight edge. We're in that world. And, Quicksand is a far departure from that. So talk about the beginning of Quicksand. How did you decide you wanted to front this thing? How did it come together? And what influences were you pulling from in piecing it together? I think after being in the, in the hardcore scene, I didn't had done, you know, I'd been to Europe, uh, went to California, toured the country, like things that I just would never have thought to have happened, made records, et cetera. You know, the scene in New York, I think it just kind of like ran its course a bit, you know, at that stage for me personally. And, um, you know, I had been playing long enough that, you know, where it all seemed mysterious to try to make a hardcore band and all that kind of stuff, I had figured out how to do it, you know. So I, I just kind of didn't really want to build that same kind of – uh you know, cabinet in a way, like I, I wanted to do something musically different without the sort of formulaic, uh, you know, cause I think hardcore has certain, what I think the beauties of it is, is the, it's limitations in a way, or at least for, you know, from my point of view, it's like, you know, you have, you have a cool slogan, you have a couple of verses and you have a mosh part and you kind of got it should get out of there about that, you know, around that time. Like it, it, there's certain like just archetypes of like what a hardcore song is. And then once you kind of step out of that, you're in a sort of, uh, you know, you're in a vulnerable spot because it, 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 you could very quickly no longer be hardcore. And then you're trying to push something that's not hardcore in a hardcore. And I just got tired of not tired, but I just got, I had to outgrew it in some ways that, as a musician, you know, which I, I really wasn't when I went into hardcore, but I came out of it. I knew how to write songs and I, I, I started to like know how to do it. So with quicksand, it was really, I wanted to play with different people uh, and do something that was like more open and, 
and undefined, you know, to like, like I wasn't trying to like make a youth of today band. I wasn't trying to make a DYS or agnostic front. I wanted to make something that hadn't been made before with people that I had never played with. So that was really the, the, the inspiration behind it. And I think bands that I was interested in at that time that were influential to me, uh, would have been, uh, uh, Fugazi for sure, because they were coming from hardcore and that's exactly what they were doing. They were creating something brand new, but with the same energy and intensity of like minor threat or, or even embrace, but musically was, was exploring different ground. So that was a very influential. Um, I loved Jane's addiction addiction because they were doing a sort of rock music that like had a trippiness to it that, had a a bigness to it, but it wasn't that it wasn't like mainstream by any stretch, but it was interesting. Uh, I was also very into um, hip hop, like I love public enemy. um, And, uh, you know, I kind of got into Slayer as well. So I had a a wide kind of palette of sort of non hardcore, but hardcore related music. So I I guess I was staged at the the same spot that maybe those guys were in, you know, who were older than me, you know, like E. Mackay didn't want to do Minor Threat. Uh, You know, I don't know what Chuck D's thinking was, but I think it was like, basically he was doing a radio show and wanted to, you know, step out of that small world. And, um, you know, uh, Jane's Addiction seemed to have some sort of like punk roots as well. Um, you know, stuff like that. There was a lot of cool stuff kind of bubbling up, you know, Sonic Youth as well. Um, you know, like, you know, kind of like I was uh, in middle school when those guys were all seniors. So now I was a bit older and I was kind of like catching on to some some of those ideas. But, you know, what we came up with was very much like there was a spontaneity to it that I, that I, I think made it exciting and you know, I was in hardcore bands, but I don't, th- because I was singing, I don't think there was really any expectation of it being good or anything. So I think that was a good position to be in as well. Yeah. So, I mean, quicksand in my mind, there's only one quicksand. It's a very defined sound. Mm-hmm. It's it's almost like a description now. What do you sound like? I sound like quicksand. And I, I like that you mentioned the hip hop influence too, because I think there's a, there's a definite hip hop flavor to it. Yeah, you couldn't, I mean, New York City, like hardcore and and hip hop in New York City were coming up absolutely parallel, you know, and we were, there was a time in the 80s where just like New York owned hip hop completely, like right right now, obviously it's ubiquitous, like it's everywhere. I can remember like LA just trying to like make up hip rap bands and it just made, it just was so far behind, like no one could touch New York, like we had everybody. And it was all within the confines of, of this city. So like New York, hardcore, like we basically had hardcore and hip hop on lock for a certain amount of years. So, I mean, that, that was like, you know, and very similar, like all the hip hop, early hip hop labels were all like indie labels, just like the hardcore labels. And, um, and it was all just very regional. So yeah, that was very much in our DNA and, and continues to be, even you know, to, to this day, like I'm always thinking in those terms, you know, to, to want to some degree. So quicksand is together. We're playing shows. Did you find acceptance with audiences? Were they into what you were doing or was there resistance because of what you were involved with before? I think there might've been some resistance, but I really wasn't concerned with it. Cause I think once we, once we had our, had made our recording and I played it for a few friends I was confident that we had done something really well, you know, that we had done something good. You know what I mean? Like I didn't really, I think there were some hardcore people that maybe would have been like, Oh, this isn't hardcore, blah, 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 blah. I didn't care honestly. Cause I just felt like we're a fucking good band. People are going to get into it or they're not. And it's just like, we're doing something cool. You like my, the people that I, you know what I mean? You have your group of friends that you respect their opinion and, you know, and I felt, I felt it. I thought, fuck, you know, if this isn't good, then I don't, then I don't know what to do. This is, this is like, this is good. And, um, and we, we, I think generally we were, we were accepted and and I think maybe even got a little bit more attention because we were doing something different. Um, and it also like spoke to people outside of our, our kind of little scene. I mean, 
so I think it, it you know, I think, I think it just landed. I was happy with where it kind of sat. Absolutely. And when, when you're on to something like that, when you, you can feel it, you know, you can feel it building, you, f- you feel like you're on to something great. Yeah. I, th- I thought we, you know, like, again, it was cool because like, there was no reason for anyone to care about what we were doing, to be honest, because like I had never sung for a band. Uh, there was no expectation. It was just like thrown out there. And, uh, you know, and I, I was, I was, we were all very, you know, just stoked to be doing something different and exciting. And, um, I think everyone, you know, and the cool thing about hardcore too, is like, you're as a musician, you know, um, you're part of your, your peer group, you know what I mean? So it's not like you're like, you know, in the Hollywood Hills coming up with some, you know, some shit to drop on people. No, I'm like at the shows, you know what I mean? So it's like, you know, what's good. You know what I mean? You know, what speaks to you. So like I, I was, you know, I think in, in, they often say like, try to create what you want to hear, you know, or what you want to see. And, um, so, you know, me with the other guys, like did a version of that. And, um, so we, we were all psyched. And so, you know, that our peers got on board too was, was cool. And, and definitely put me on, um, you know, we, I had had success with, with Gorilla Biscuits and Youth Today. I'd done a lot of amazing things, but it was cool to now start off on this new path, you know, with, with, with different people that I had, you know, I knew them to some degree, but they were not in my, like, you know, I was playing with different people and, and that was exciting too. Cause you know, when you're in a, in a group, you're a different person with different people, you know? So other things come out, uh, other things, you know, maybe you, you, you shed them or, you know, apply them in a, in a different way. So, uh, that made it more fun. Absolutely. And at what point did you get the attention of a major, a major label? Talk about that a little bit. I think probably with, I mean, it's, it's hard to remember like time wise the timeline, but the seven ish came out and, you know, maybe within, within that year, for sure. Uh, there was major labels sniffing around because I think within that time frame, if Nirvana didn't happen, it was like on the way of happening. So I think we were getting offers from like larger indie labels, like important or something like that, you know, sort of like, uh, labels that were like uh bigger than revelation and more corporate or like caroline stuff like that uh but then i think once nirvana happened then it just then you know it seemed pretty obvious that we were gonna get signed to a major label which was uh you know i thought was cool and at the same time i was like a little nervous about because you know at that time it would be like oh you're selling out and you know so that i had to like Deal, have that, you know, kind of, uh, talk with myself and, uh, you know, which looking back is, is sort of absurd, but it really is because it's a ridiculous thought to be like, Oh no, this is my band. I don't want people to know about it. Or, Oh, I don't want you to move forward with what you're doing. It's a, it's a young childish way to think, but did you have to deal with any of that? Cause I mean, there's plenty of bands out there who signed to majors and people wouldn't let them move on or they ran into a lot of turmoil. Did you have to deal with any of that? I, I think, you know, we kind of got through all right. You know, I don't, I don't think that it's like not a hundred percent, you know, bullshit either, because I mean, like you are then, and my experience was, was, I would say mostly very positive, but I mean, you know, you're, you're now taking that element of, you know, what I said, the DIY element of like your music, where it was just like four kids by kids. And now you're like talking with people that are older that are giving you all this money, but they're, you know, you're under contract and, um, you know, you're commodifying your music, you know what I mean? So you're now turning it into a product. So, I mean, on the one hand, like that is a, that is real. The other side of it is like, these people are going to like, you can live in an apartment and a nicer apartment and travel in a tour bus and people are going to hear you and uh, you're going to have a lot of fun and you can, you know, so it's it's a trade-off, you know what I mean? At that stage, you know, having played for such a long time, you know, I've been through all different versions of it, 
You know what I mean? And now I'm way more autonomous. I mean, I'm on a label, uh, Epitaph, who are like an independent label, which is amazing. Uh, but the relationship has changed. You know what I mean? Like it used to be like way more like this, you know, monolithic uh, record label with, you know, all these adults who have like, you know, gold records on their walls and shit like that. But, you know, it, it, I think I never really, uh, I, I felt had a, had an advantage having gone through, you know, by the time I did like a quicksand record, you know, I had made more records than my A&R guy. You know, I had more experience doing this than the actual person that's supposed to be the one that knows how to do it. So that that was kind of an interesting juxtaposition. But um, you know, nowadays the the the, the situation is 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 much different. You know what I mean? So I think it's like you have an opportunity to be way more autonomous. But you know, the decisions that you make are are still count. You know what I mean? Like, but at that time, it was more like there was a little bit of a backlash if someone like sold out, you know what I mean? There's still ways to sell out, but you know, that's not one of them. I don't think as much anymore. Talk about the difference between now and back then during slip and manic compression. I mean, quicksand was a band working on a major label for a while. You had two LPs out. I didn't realize you have like five music videos or something like that. You're a working band with the major label for a long time. Talk about the landscape of working in that environment then versus now? I mean, the coolness of it was, it was exciting because you're going into this world, this tradition of, uh, <clears throat> you know, our manager had managed like Motley Crue, you know, like, so I'm hearing Motley Crue stories. I'm getting taken out to dinner left and right, you know, like CDs were cool. So I'm getting all these CDs for free. I'm going to all these different shows for free, you know, just a whole bunch of cool shit was like open to me. And, uh, you know, I'm taking cars here and there. So, you know, I, I quicksand did, did well, like we sold some records. I, I was never like, you know, we were never really making money for them, but you know, those kind of things as a, as a young man, that was really fun, exciting stuff. And there were so many people at the record labels that were really cool, that were fun to work with. And, you know, we were going to the shows for free and, and had all those kind of, you know, access that was just like the kind of thing that seemed like you had hit some like, uh, you know, different plane of existence if you're interested in music, you know what I mean? It was, it was exciting. So all that stuff was really good. The, the, the more tricky spots and, and this wasn't really such an issue for me with quicksand, but you know, maybe there is a subtle, uh, it's a subtle thing, but you know, you do have all these other people involved in your shit. So like, I would, I have chosen to play, you know, 300 shows in a year, like not on my own. No, I wouldn't have, but you know, you're on a major label. So you have to constantly be promoting the record. So, you know, that's sort of, that kind of shit was a little absurd you know, just doing meetings, you know, that are just sort of like, don't mean anything or like, you know, making videos that are sort of, you know, some of them come out good. Some of them are dumb. And, you know, that kind of like, that can be, you know, can be a struggle. I, I, my experience was generally positive in that side of it. Like I worked with a lot of cool people, uh, had a lot of great times and, you know, there were some things that, you know, could have played out differently. Um, but, you know, I don't, I can't really hang blame. It's just like the way the experience goes and like, you know, your own youth and like your own decisions that you make. So, um, but overall, you know, there are a lot of pitfalls and I have friends that, you know, they just signed with the wrong people or their record came out at the wrong time or it, it just didn't come out the way that as good as they had hoped uh, you know, for creative reasons or whatever. And, you know, those bands might've done better, you know, sticking with a, with an indie or something like that. But, you know, it all just, you know, life unfolds the way that it does. And you can't really, you know, you, you, these hypothetical uh, counter histories are just, you know, that's just, you can waste a lot of time with that. So my, my, my experience was um, I felt very, I felt, kind of uh amazed and and uh excited 
uh, for it. And, uh, you know, looking back, it's a pretty, pretty cool time to be doing what we were doing. Talk about rival schools. Now, United by Fate, a classic. Talk about your approach coming into this band versus, say, Quicksand. Now, Quicksand was on the road 300 days out of the year. Like you said, uh, everybody got burned out. The band ended. We tried to come back together for a tour, but it didn't work out. So talk about your mindset moving into rival schools. How did you approach it differently and what did you want to accomplish? Yeah, I mean, Quicksand just had kind of run its course, you know, and that's that's a thing like, yeah, like that that sort of like I, I if I were to characterize it as a negative, you're that that amount of work was pretty intense. So we kind of got burned out. And I don't think we were like our best selves to each other. Um, so that kind of, you know, we're going to break up. It's done, blah, 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 blah. So the record label said, OK, that's cool. We want to keep your contract, Walter. And um, so, you know, you're just going to make a solo project or a band or whatever you want to do. So, you know, I was like, cool, that's good. You know, I was thinking I was going to become a fireman or do some other kind of thing. But they, uh, you know, they kept my contract. But then there was some like, and this is where it starts to get a little bit more squirrely is like, so the record label I was on got bought by some other company. And then that created, uh, you know, a whole bunch of people got fired, some new people got hired. So like almost a year or so went by where I wasn't, I was just making demos, you know, like, so I was no longer participating. I was no longer like playing to, to fans, you know, I was, I wasn't with my group anymore. And, uh, so I just kind of got in this sort of like very typical kind of, um, demo holding pattern, which major labels do because, you know, these records are expensive. Uh, it not only costs a lot of money to make them, but then you have to promote them. So, you know, they're budgeting out a million dollars or something like that. They, they sometimes need to get around to that. You know, if you're not like a, a hot shit, new, new thing, which for me, I was someone that they kind of had already anyway. So, um, I think I just ended up in this pattern. These all people got fired, new people came in. And then one day the new people, you know, all the, all the dust settled and they called me in as all right, we want you to make a record. And, you know, all these other artists have gotten dropped. So I, st I felt kind of like, wow, well, they must really believe in me. So, um, you know, I called called uh, Sam Siegler, who uh, I had worked with in GB and uh, on Civ. And um, and he's, you know, I've known him since we, we've known each other since we were we were little kids. And um, we, uh, you know, kind of got Cash Tolman, who also had played with Civ. And, um, just started, you know, making demos and we were doing demos there for a minute too, because they were just waiting to like make the budget open to, for us to make a record. So it was kind of a pain in the ass to be honest, because, you know, with quicksand is like, they were signing us, they wanted us. So it was already, they already liked what we had. Whereas like with rival schools, I had to like put a band together, create the songs and make something that they believed in to open up the budget. Did they, uh, give you any direction Were they like this is what we want or did they just leave that to you to to come up with the music uh i don't really remember them giving me much direction i think that they were kind of just like waiting for me to you know just for the the time to just be right you know what i mean for for me to for them to have for me to have the songs that they felt would justify making a record and that lining up with what their release schedule was is my guess but they were you know they would they were giving me enough money to live. And, you know, I was then breaking off my, the other guys in the band enough money to live. So, I mean, in a way it was sort of like, uh, I don't want to say golden handcuffs because the handcuffs weren't that nice, but you know, you're basically in a holding pattern. So, um, eventually over time that came together. And, and at that time, uh, by the time we had enough songs and the record label was backing it and all that kind of shit, it was rival schools. So this is probably a few years on from quicksand having broken up. So, um, you know, I think I had kind of had definitely come up with a new vibe in that time. Uh, and, uh, you know, but also the, the, the page had turned on a lot of the stuff that I was like, you know, 
I, I was no longer the young kid anymore. You know, like I was young, but I was no longer the kid. So rival schools kind of came out into a different atmosphere, a different environment. You know what I mean? And I th- think, you know, while I, I felt like the process was a little bit more bullshit, major labely, not, not that it was anyone's fault. I think that's just like the nature of it. Um, you know, ultimately we got to make the record and, you know, I, I, I still like it. Yeah. I think still think it's a great record. And, uh, I think it's probably aged better than I even thought, you know, in, in a lot of ways. So I'm really proud of it. And, you know, we had, we had some really cool success with it too. So, um, you know, that was kind of like, a, you know, having done Gorilla Biscuits, having done Youth Today, having done Quicksand and now doing Rival Schools, I kind of started to recognize like, hey, maybe I'm like a musician. Maybe this is like what I do. This is kind of cool. So it wasn't until then that you thought, hey, this is what I do. Yeah, because it was never a career thing. It just you know, it seemed insane to me to be like, I'm going to become a professional musician or I'm a songwriter or I'm a, you know, I'm an artist or any of those kind of ideas made were not really that uh, that was just not really in my thinking. So to me it was just like I was still waiting to go back to college. You know what I mean? To get a real job, you know? And um, I think at that time I started to accept like, well, fuck, this is what I do. I'm good at it. So like, why not believe that and be, be about that? And, um, and that, that was, you know, a cool thing to, to kind of get a, get a handle on. How was the reception to rival schools? You're touring United by fate is out. What was the response from fans and from the label? Uh, it was different based on like uh, the, the label in the States didn't, they put us out on tour and we got a lot of love from, uh, what would be called the, this emo wave of like kind of dashboard confessional Thursday, get up kids like that. Like those kids had like grown up on quicksand to some degree. So we got a lot of love from those guys on like, a on a sort of like being adopted by that scene and uh, did a lot of great touring, you know, based on that. And we did a tour. Well, God, it was a crazy tour. We did uh, a tour with the hives and uh, international noise conspiracy with the hives opening for rival schools, which is insane because they were basically the best live band in the whole world at that point. And so we did a lot of cool stuff in the States, but the record label did not, do a single for us. So we had really cool songs on this album, but they didn't put them to the, to the radio. So we never really got past this sort of, you know, sort of like fans of quicksand and stuff like that. And a little bit more than that, but like it didn't like break through on, on that sort of level. But interestingly uh, in Europe, they did do a single and we did really, really well. So uh, where, you know, well, Gorilla Biscuits and Youth Today and it really w- wasn't anything beyond the punk scene in, in Europe, but um, Quicksand did not have that exposure in England or, or, or Europe on a pop level where rival schools did. Like, so, you know, I was on MTV a whole bunch. You know, people would recognize me in the street and I just like wouldn't know who was going to come at me. You know what I mean? Because it was like, it was just more pop for lack of a better word. And I'm not saying like we were like the biggest thing in the whole world, but um, you know, I was on like the cover of Kerrang, like just, it's just a different level playing all these festivals. So that was a a lot of fun, you know, to kind of like get outside of the, you know, I guess with quicksand, we surely got out of the hardcore orbit, but um, with rival schools, I was in a, a whole different realm of, uh, 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 than I had been familiar with. And um, so that was really fun. And like, especially in England, England's so fun and Europe is great. And, you know, playing Australia and all these places that kind of, um, you know, kind of take their, their, their lead from, uh, from uh, the UK. So that was really awesome. And, you know, we're playing really big shows over in, in the UK and, and in Europe. And uh, so that was a whole other level. So, you know, that, that kept it interesting for me. 
Yeah, it was a different level. I remember you had a video and I remember, I think I was in a Hollister in the mall and I heard uh, the single playing and I was like, oh, okay, look at this. Yeah, you know, we got out there. I mean, Use for Glue, just that the company, like, you know, in in America, you want to put out a single, like you have to like, it costs like hundreds of thousands of dollars. You have to like get hookers and cocaine for everybody. It's it's a whole shebang. <laughs> and they were like, dude, we're not doing, you know, we're not giving, we're going to give it to Hoobastank. Uh, you know, we'll see how they do. Uh, put them on tour with so-and-so. So, but in Europe, it was just like, we were there, you know, it, it was a lot of fun. So what happened with Rival Schools? One album, and then you took a break for a while. What happened? Well, during Rival Schools, where we were like really just kind of peaking, and the guitar player wanted to quit the band, and I don't know, just kind of took some of the the. That's my dog chewing on her toy for our listeners. <laughs> Mimi, come here. I'm told that dogs chew on these things because it sounds like an animal crying, but I don't know an animal sounds honky <laughs> like that. Um. Anyways, yeah, I don't know. That kind of took the wind out of the, our sails a bit, and then. You know, I think, you know, we had been really busy too. And just like things were just sort of like, I might have had a little bit of just being over it. Um, And then when we, um, we were getting ready to do another album and then, you know, it was just a bit of the demos. They weren't stoked on the demos for the record. And it's like, I just don't want to do this shit again. I don't want to like make demos for two years to like have a record come out that the record label, and this is mainly in America, uh, isn't going to really support. And, uh, you know, I probably could have had, it's not like they were assholes, you know, like they had their own r- realities to deal with, you know, like the people that work at the record company. And if they don't think your songs are good, like, or, or, or the, what they're looking for, not even about being good, you know, it doesn't make them dicks or anything, but it's just like, I just didn't want to go through that having, you know, in my, in my mind, having sort of, given to that process, like, you know, three or four years of just like making demos. Uh, I, I just didn't really want to deal with that. So I really set off on doing something that I just wanted to do, whether people liked it or didn't. And, uh, and I wanted to do something like stylistically different again, like, you know, which is probably like, I wouldn't do that now. Like, I think looking back, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy with the, the, which ended up being the walking concert record. I'm so happy with that record. It's like amazing, but it didn't have to be, you know, like one could have happened with the other. So I wish I had maybe spent more time, uh, caring for this idea of rival schools. But at that time I was just a little bit more rash. So that, that was my take. That was my take on it. It was just like, I'm not getting paid enough to like make demos for Island records for the next two years. I, I just didn't want to do it. And, um, and I didn't really want to like, uh, it, and it seemed like anticlimactic for the band is there's just my, my thinking at the time, if I remember, but I think, you know, I'm grateful for the fact that, you know, all the guys in rival schools, you know, we remained friends and we were later able to get together and, and make pedals, which is an awesome record. And, um, And we also put out uh, Found, which is the demos for the second record, which is also available out there. You know, but it's like, I've been doing music for such a while now that, you know, it's all you just, you're constantly learning and, you know, everything's a step on the way to the next thing. So, but that's kind of how, how that, how that sort of kind of at that stage, like, petered out you know just between our guitar player and quitting and just you know me being sick of the of the game a bit yeah so uh walking concert is when i really first saw you in person now at this time around 2004 quicksand was just the stuff of legends you know they were gone i was never going to see them again i was into manic compression i finally heard uh slip around 2003 i was into that i saw you play acoustic one time i think so Walking Concert was a band, and I'm like, great, I, I like this, I want to go see this. So talk about that a little bit. What were you into? What was your thing? I was really into the Kinks and um, Sid Barrett and um, just like mu- music that I was 
Bob Dylan. Like I was really into the 1960s music scene, like super about like pop structures, like song structures from that era. T-Rex, um, you know, so I think with like quicksand or, you know, I guess genre music, you know, like I was coming from this punk hardcore tradition and then it became post hardcore and then they started calling it emo. So that was kind of like my line. Right. And I wanted to kind of, I was part of it, but I was never like trying to be it exactly. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to like delve into some other shit and like lyrically, you know, uh, take different approaches. And, uh, I, I changed my method, you know, where I would be bringing in riffs to a band and, you know, recording it and putting the vocals on at the last minute. I changed my process where I was just like writing the songs on acoustic guitar so that I could perform them on acoustic guitar, on acoustic guitar and with the vocal and the lyrics. So I think walk in concert, the songs are really just some of my just best songwriting and especially the lyrics. Like I, re- I listen to the lyrics and I, I don't know if it's, it's, you know, me tooting my own horn, but I think just, I was just really in the zone at, the, at that, you know, uh, that time, you know, just like the craft sort of. And um, so, yeah, I, I think it's really some of my best work and, um, and also just like my most, uh, as you know, my personal thing is like a, a cool turn from what I was known for. But I mean, the price to pay for that was, you know, if you like rival schools and you heard walking concert, it wasn't an easy jump, you know, it was something else. So I think that that was something I didn't care about, except that as it proceeded, it's like, I think over time is like, if people like something that you're doing, you, it's sort of on you to, you know, lead them in to some degree, unless you don't want to. Um, and I just wasn't thinking about that. So like walking concert, I think it's like, I don't want to say it's my best record because I think I, I, I think all my records have, you know, a, a quality to them, but it's one that I'm most proud of, but it was my first one that wasn't like, for lack of a better word, like really a hit with, it didn't expand my fan base. Let's just put it that way. You know? Um, So it was more like, okay, you got your wish. You're making the kind of cool music that you want to make, but it's a much smaller thing. um, And it's not going to really, it's, it's not indicating that it's going to be sustainable in a, in a sort of like monetary way. But you know, that was never my really that's just never really was a consideration for me going into it. Right. And I'm surprised because I remember seeing you guys at least once and you guys were on fire, sounded great. Everybody looked good. So did that unsustainability as far as the money and that stuff goes, did that lead to the end of it? To some degree? Yeah. Like I just, it was the first time in a way that, you know, and it's something I had to learn over time is like, it's not just being good that makes something successful. That's just a component of it. So to me, like, yeah, the band was great. I thought we had made an amazing record, but you know, it just didn't catch with a new audience. I mean, yes, some new people, uh, but it was like my most open-minded fans and, you know, some people. So it wasn't like, you know, I mean, that was a big leap to go from Gorilla Biscuits to Quicksand that worked out. I brought everyone along and Rival Schools also maintained a lot of that group. But, and for those that I lost, I gained a whole bunch of people, but Walking Concert didn't really succeed in those ways, except as a songwriter, like, I feel like I had never done anything as good, you know, in a way. I mean, I guess that that I shouldn't say that because I I feel like I said I think all all my stuff is is good but uh, I guess I was most proud of it because there was just so much cool it was sort of like to me a sort of um, accumulation of all the all the skills that I had honed over over a decade or so 
uh, applied to some new style style of of music, which was like not really like new revolutionary, but like new for me. You know, a lot of people were doing like and will always do '60s inspired stuff, but uh, you know, it's just context. You know, I probably wasn't for someone that's like into like sixties music and someone plays them. Oh, what's this new thing? Oh, it's the guy from quicksand or, Oh, it's the guy from I was supposed. They don't necessarily want to hear that from me. You know what I mean? So even if it's really good, that's maybe not what they want to hear f- from me. This is just me like Monday morning QB uh, on that, but like context, like when does something come out? Like who is telling you about it? You know, like all those things have, have, you know, like, would Gorilla Biscuits have been as much of a thing if we just, you know, if we uh, came out a couple of years later, or a couple of years earlier, you know what I mean? It's, it's like all those things play into like why something's successful or not successful. But, uh, you know, the, the, the thing for me was I was a little bit perplexed of, after having made something that I thought was so awesome to have it be received, uh, well, it just didn't, it just didn't expand the fan base, you know, really. So, uh, so yeah, so that was, that was something. And that kind of got me to do, uh, a solo album. Cause then I just felt if I'm going to make records that are more smaller and more like about like creative freedom, then I might as well just be making records under my own name. So that was the next thing I did, you know, which walking concert I thought about putting out on my own under my own name as well, but I just didn't think it was catchy, you know, cause my name is just sort of like not, it's not David Bowie, you know what I mean? It's not like a catchy, you know, uh, name, but th- that was maybe my own hang up. So at that stage, I just thought like, I don't care. I'm just going to do, do a solo album and that at least draw people to my name you know which i which uh you know which i think was the right call actually yeah your solo shows are some of my favorite shows i like watching you go across the span of the career of your music and the storytelling and everything that's incorporated in it it's it's good stuff oh thank you thank you so yeah having a record that i'm also really proud of that record um that that could kind of create that vehicle for me was uh was really fun and I think shit. I might have been living in Germany at that time. So anyway, I, the the solo record was a lot of fun. You know, just being able to like, and I haven't done solo shows in a while, but um, there was that was a really fun period for me. Like, just you know, sometimes I'd play with a band, but it, also I could just do it on my own with an acoustic guitar, and like having that freedom was was really what I needed at that time. Yeah, and uh, it, it's such a power to be able to just have you up there with the guitar and, and reach people. I mean, when I would see you play Open Letter, when I hear that song still, ooh, that tugs at the hard strings. That's great oh, stuff. Oh, man, thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, when you're, when you're up there with just an acoustic guitar, it's, you know, it's all on you. So in some ways it's really easy. In other ways it's like, you know, it, it, it's, it's a challenge. So, uh, you know, I, I would give like 100%, you know, like, when I'm playing a show, like my focus, your focus has to be on point, you know? And, um, and you know, it, and it's fun, you know, just that, that Jesus Christ, like not having to like pack up a friggin' amp or all that kind of crap. And I would just like get a car and travel around and, uh, uh, you know, that, that sort of, um, gypsy side of me is like really that, that, that's really got a lot of appeal. So quicksand has a new album out. Mm -hmm. distant populations now number one this is a great record thank you number two talk about your approach to this record versus interiors now interiors was your first record together in a long time i'm sure there Mm -hmm. was a lot of discussions i'm sure there was a lot of figuring stuff out compare the process and the, the experience in distant populations to some of what you experienced with interiors well i think with interiors it was uh you know we had played a a reunion tour and, you know, we kind of like took that as far as we could. And it was an incredible experience, you know, to have, you know, feel the love and, and, you know, kind of, you know, remind ourselves of how, you know, how our chemistry and, you know, as people, you know, that we love each other and that we, you know, can still do cool stuff together. So, you know, the only other thing we could do is make another record if we, otherwise, you know, we kind of, it kind of had run its course. So yeah, the pressures of that 
were if you make a comeback record, you know, and everyone already loves the band and feels, you know, that this is a legendary band and there's like, you know, a, a, an ownership to that and you come with a, a, a new record and that record's lame, you really just take the air out of it, you know? So y- you want to come with something really good, but you can't to, to come with something that's sort of like a re, um, an, a, an approximation of what you were you know, 15, 20 years ago, you're already at a disadvantage because you're just kind of like, you know, you're not giving them the real shit in a way, you know, you're just trying to uh, approximate it. So I think the challenge for us was to like, get over that and just be like, let's just make a record that we think is good and not worry too much about if it's, you know, especially like, is it heavy enough? Is it going to, you know, like all that kind of stuff, like, because if we get into that, it's going to come off fake. And if people don't like what we're doing, I want, I at least want to have it that I like it. Cause then you can handle it. If you put out something not good and other people think it's not good, that's your worst case. <laughs> so, right. And uh, I don't know about you, but I can't write something that's not genuine. Like I can't say, Oh, I need it to be this. And then manufacture that it has to come from my heart. That, that's also, that's another thing. It's not easy to do that is the other side of it, you know, to try to create something that you think will please people is also difficult to do. And, and, you know, so we kind of, once we like, you know, and we paid for that record ourselves. So it was like, that was another good thing is like, if this record's bad, we just spent a lot of money and that's fucked up too. So, uh, you know, that put a little pressure on it. So we, you know, we made sure that it came out good and we did our best work and, you know, we got great feedback and, you know, it was really well received and we were able to like go on tour again. And that was really awesome. So having that, having accomplished that, you know, like, okay, so are we done now? You know, we got this out of our system or what? And we, our feeling was like, we went into that last record, like not really knowing what the hell to do. Now we've done these tours and we have a sense of like what worked. Our chemistry is really strong now. And, you know, we know the songs that we want to write. So, um, we had more focus. So going into, uh, distant populations, we just had a lot more confidence and a lot more, um, even beyond confidence, just like, um, we knew what we wanted to do. We, we had a better idea of what would work well for us. So it was really kind of one of the smoothest and funnest records, uh, that I've recorded, you know, uh, it, it really went well, you know, and, um, you know, and, and I felt that we had made a better record than interiors. And I felt that, you know, is really the best record that we had made, you know, I mean, you can't change the time and place of like, say the first time you heard quicksand, it's, it's not that for some people it is. Um, but objectively speaking, I, I'm, we're all very pleased with it. So like when it came out and we just got s- such, you know, I don't know, it was just really well received and just, you know, you know, our peers and, you know, and fans just being like s- psyched on this thing. Um, yeah, that, that was a great feeling and, and, you know, just feeling like we, you know, our band broke up all those years ago, we came back with a record and then we we continued on and and we're just like you know uh growing and and developing as as musicians and and as people and like well you know we're very lucky you know so so i think that that kind of factors in as well so i mean i think this like second stage of quicksand um i'm enjoying it probably a lot more than i actually did the first time around or you know in 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 many ways, you know, it's just like more on our terms, you know, and, uh, and, and our, I think our, our interpersonal relationships were all just like, so on the same page. It's, it's very cool. That's a great thing. Yeah. I'm glad the band decided to reunite. I'm glad we have new music because when I got into hardcore quicksand was just a fable, you know, they were this great band that they're not around anymore. So to be able to see those shows and to be able to hear the new stuff you're doing is great. 
Oh, thank you very much. Absolutely. So, I mean, you've done so much in music, all of the bands we described, Dead Heavens, Vanishing Life, the solo records, everything. Is there anything you haven't done yet that you're looking to do in the world of music? Yeah, I mean, all the time. I mean, I, I, I'm working on all kinds of stuff right now, and I, I kind of, I'm one usually to just like let it reveal itself when it, when it's done. But like, uh, I, I mean, if you look at all the the kind of records that I've made, it's always about whatever I did before. I'm I'm trying to like reinvent, you know, and and not in a in a way of um, you know not for the sake of doing it, but just because I'm interested in taking things further and and uh, you know seeing seeing where I can uh, go with this. So I, I've been very very lucky and and um, and especially now I'm I'm very appreciative and and have a lot more fun with it really uh, than ever before. How about this? Walter Schreifel's post rock album. What do you think? Post rock. Uh, so what, what, what is, I always mess up these, these genre de- definitions. Post rock would be who's the ultimate post rock band. That's like the emotional instrumental stuff, Mogwai, explosions in the sky. All oh, that yeah, kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, I feel like that's, that's in there. You know, I don't, I, I don't want to, I, I think that that's, uh, yeah, I love. I, I appreciate all that, and uh, I've been I've been stacking up some tracks during this COVID period. So uh, yeah, there could be some post rock out there. I'm looking forward to that. Speaking of COVID, has the pandemic changed you in any way? Uh, I think you know I'm experiencing it like everyone else is. Um, you know, uh, from you know, I just got COVID like in over the New Year, um, and it was very mild. So it was kind of cool to just party with COVID and experience it. And it was not so terrible after all these, I mean, you know, it was, I'm vaxxed up and, uh, you know, I caught a mild strain of it, but, um, but you know, all the, the lockdown and all the kind of like, you know, freakiness of all our, you know, normal routines being broken up. I mean, you know, it's, there's a, there's a, a PTSD that I think we're all experiencing um, and if we're not experiencing it personally, we're experiencing through the people that are experiencing it. So uh, I would like to see uh, in the next year or two, I'm hoping, um, a little bit less, uh, you know, this kind of like these critical freakouts that we have been going through and maybe just some more like normalization if we can but you know i think personally like in a lot of ways it's i i've it's been great to be honest like the lockdown i was upstate in upstate new york um and you know was living country life for like a while and uh got to spend a lot of time with my family uh i saw friends uh in in a in, in a you know kind of special environment you know uh i uh I I ran my first marathon, you know, just things were, you know, kind of changed in ways. Uh, I mean, if I, if I could make it not happen, if I could make COVID never have happened, I would choose that. But, uh, in some ways it's been, uh, you know, on the positive side, there has been some like, you know, time to, uh, appreciate and to assess other things in life, you know, that, that maybe, you know, uh, prior to that slowdown, uh, you know, might have just bulldozed over, you know, and like, um, as we come back into speed, you know, as, as things have opened up and, you know, right now things are, you know, things kind of closed down. Now they're opening up a little bit, but, um, you know, as like the, the hustle of life starts to reenter, you know, you're a bit more aware of the speed of it and like, you know, taking care of like what, what you want. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, that, that pause for me was, uh, not, uh, not all bad, you know, for sure. Yeah. It really opened my eyes as to how crazy life was before, as far as traveling and work and all this stuff. Like now, if I have to go into Manhattan for something, I'm like, Oh my God, how'd I do this before? Yeah. I think a lot of people were like, what the hell was I doing? You know? And, uh, you know, you see a lot of people, I don't know how they're doing it, but you know, a lot of people are leaving their jobs because maybe they got a little bit of a sense of, uh, you know, get your priorities. What is important to you? 
you know, and um, I think uh, I, I was I, I I appreciated that about it, and um, you know, even when I got COVID, I appreciated having a week where I just couldn't go out and do anything. You know, I didn't mind it. You know, I hung out with my wife who also had COVID, and we had a great a great time. You know, just like having things put on pause. I'm not recommending anybody get COVID, but like, um, and mine was very mild, but, um, but you know, that experience was cool. And I think the, the, the lockdown for me, like, uh, I appreciated parts of it. Of course, there's all kinds of shit that's bad about it. And especially like, obviously like so many people have died and, you know, people are, 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 are very, uh, fearful of, um, you know, there's a lot of fear sp- spread about, uh, you know, vaccines There's so much like hostility and division over so many different things that like, you know, I, and, and to be fair, I think the United States was pretty insane prior to the, you know, the pandemic, you know, with, you know, like when you think about like the Trump era, people were maniacs before that, but, um, you know, maybe that, that has accelerated people's fears and, and, and all that. So I'm not psyched on that, but you know, that shit's maybe been swept under the rug and people need to, to air their, their, you know, speak their truth or air their crazy or whatever it is. And we're just going through it. Um, so, you know, there's a part of me that also accepts it, even though it's not all, you know, a lot of it's hard and, and, and especially for, you know, I have a a 14 year old daughter, you know, she was, she won't know, doesn't know the difference, but I mean, she was basically screwed out of a year of, of some good times, you know, with her friends and, and, you know, you know, people have lost, you know, loved ones and, um, you know, have been affected in all kinds of shitty ways. So, you know, I'm not happy for any of that, but, you know, so in that way, I'm, I'm, this is just the time we're living in and I'm trying to make the best of it. Same here, same here. And I hope brighter and more normal days are ahead. But well, we're winding down to the end now. So folks, here's what we're going to do. Now, if you've been living under a rock and don't know yet, Distant Populations by Quicksand is out. Listen to it today. Purchase it today, right? Yeah, purchase it. That's better. Yeah. Come on. Help Walter out. Why not? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> or don't. It's fine. <laughs> and do you have any tour dates or anything planned that you want to announce here in the end? Um, you know, all that stuff is so um, touch and go right now. But we have – we are – there's going to be some festivals we're playing in the States. And um, we're going to be playing in Europe and uh, looks like Japan too. But all this kind of stuff is just very uh, – touch and go but when we're able to we will be playing more shows well we look forward to that and walter we just want to say thank you for coming on the show tonight you know we grew up with your music and myself and tommy and many others out there really appreciate what you do so thank you so much uh thank you it's a pleasure talking with you guys There you have it, folks. Walter Schreifels. It was so awesome to get to talk to him. Tommy, like you mentioned in the first segment, dream guest. Dream guest. I've I've envisioned having him on the show for a long time, so I'm glad it happened. It was really nice to be able to talk about the old days of quicksand, the new days of quicksand, rival schools, United by Fate, one of my most favorite records, walking concert when I finally got to see him in person playing with a band. You know, this was one of those, there was just so much to get to. You could easily do three hours with the guy. He just has so much musical history. It's almost impossible to cover all of it in a way that it's, you're getting to all the nooks and crannies of everything because there's so many things and there's so many subtleties to everything that goes along with that. So uh, I just, I really appreciate his time. I, I know he's a busy man, but he, he literally was so unbelievably fun and nice and accommodating. Uh, what a great guess. And on top of that, uh, you know, they always say, don't meet your heroes. Uh, they're fucking wrong. <laughs> the dude was unbelievably nice. Walter was so accommodating and so kind. And 
man, he just has so many great stories and is just able to explain things in a way that makes you feel like you're a part of it. I, I really, I don't mind talking to someone like that for such a long period of time because everything he's telling you, you feel like you're just, you're part of what he's doing. Like it, it, he has that way about him of making you feel like you're part of it and that you are, you're welcome to be there. And not only are you welcome to be there, he's happy that you're there. <laughs> like It's really, it was really, really fun. <laughs> yeah. We were talking to him a little bit afterwards too, while the tracks were uploading just about where we live and different things. And one thing we didn't mention, he also has the live stream interview show on Vans channel 66. Yeah, I definitely want to check that out. I want to see him interview people. They have great musical guests, too. So if you go to van66.com and then search for Walter, um, you'll find his show on there. You have to watch it, though, when it's on. There are no, you can't watch it afterwards. Like, you have to watch it while it's live. It's a live stream. Yeah. What do you think if we did that, Tommy? Like, you can only listen to the podcast Monday morning from... 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Well, it's not happening then. I, <laughs> I, 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 got, I have first period then, so no. <laughs> yeah, we'd really be shooting ourselves in the foot. You could easily just do an hour and a half with Walter on like early New York hardcore. Oh, yeah. No, for sure. And it's, it's so funny because I always associate like early New York hardcore with kind of like that kind of gnarly tattooed real in your face kind of thing and he's like the opposite of that like he's this real nice like hey guys let's talk about this like he's very very kind he's a very kind soul yeah so it was great to get to hear about all that and of course distant populations one of our favorite records from last year you know quicksand is back and stronger than ever I'm just glad they're around again because I've seen them a couple times since they've reunited and they're putting out excellent music still, which is great because 10 years ago, wait, oh shit, more than that at this point, oh, 15 years ago, yeah, <laughs> you never thought you'd see them again. Time flies, yeah? <laughs> Oof. I was like, geez, 10 years ago, they were doing the first reunions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in typical me fashion, I went to a quicksand reunion show in Philly at, it was at Union Transfer, and I got extremely drunk before the show. And then I, I was getting a little rowdy during Phaser. Oh, Lord. And my friend was there, and he was like, yeah, I thought you were like getting in a fight during the show. And I think I was just getting pushed around a bit, and I barely remember any of the show. Oh. Well, those days are behind us. Yeah, I've seen them since then, and I do remember that show. What do you think of that? I think that's a phenomenal, uh, what do you call that? It, that that's progress keith yes yes because then you can actually think back to the show and remember it <laughs> there's a lot <laughs> there's a lot of shows i've been to i i don't have a full recollection of it however anytime i've seen all else failed in the last i don't know eight years or so i remember almost every moment of it Right, because we don't drink at all at the show. <laughs> I, 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 I say at the show because you, I, I don't want to give people the wrong idea. Tommy, you do drink. Yeah, uh, like, you do drink a little bit sometimes. Casual, yeah. Like uh, I had, I had drinks at uh, Christmas this year. Like uh, this, yeah. the, I had a drink. Uh, I had two drinks at Christmas this year, uh, and then uh, when we had my um, father-in-law's uh, memorial dinner, uh, I had a glass of Jameson. Like you know, I, I. I I have drinks from time to time. Let's just put it this way, though. Uh, I don't have, I don't ever put like a, a numerical limit on it. I just know when I've had enough. I, I, I get that feeling of like, let's get another one. That's when my brain tells me you should stop now. Well, I haven't had any drinks or drugs since May of 2017. What do you think of that? I think it's a phenomenal anniversary, and I can't wait to celebrate with you every year until we're old. <laughs> and then when we and I haven't had I haven't had any tobacco products since I don't know. It's been over a year, year and a half, maybe. Oh Lord, I that's one of those ones I really should have kept track of my dates. I don't even know. I haven't. I'll say this: I haven't smoked a cigarette in a couple years. That's good. Uh, there was a brief period of time when we f were doing this show. Uh, when we got in the fight. Yeah, that one. <laughs> I went out and bought one of those little disposable vapes. And 
<laughs> I was like, well, no, let me, I don't want to mislead the audience. We didn't get in a fight, but we had a pretty intense conversation. Oh, yeah. And it was, yeah. yeah. I didn't, would never, we, I would, we weren't yelling. Oh, no. We weren't like yelling at each other or cursing at each other or anything. But we had a we had a pretty intense conversation. But it, I, it was one of those things where uh, that conversation was eventually going to be had, and I'm glad I had it in a way that was productive. Because essentially, what we decided was from that point on, what we were going to do is every time we're done the show, we need to sit down and talk. Let's just have these conversations every single time we're done recording so that whatever's bothering us or whatever we think needs to change about the show or whatever we think is even really going well, those kind of like little debrief sessions kind of give us the opportunity to talk about stuff in a, a way that's healthy and really constructive and makes the show a better, uh, a better product. On to more important news. Tommy, how are you doing? Now, I mean you as a person. Are you stressed? Are you happy? Are you content? Are you in touch with your spiritual side? Lay it on me. Uh, let's leave the spiritual stuff out for a moment. Uh, <laughs> I'll go with, I am a little bit stressed right now. Uh, I have a lot of irons in the fire in terms of uh, work and family. We got a lot of things that are going on uh, simultaneously with trying to do some home improvement stuff and kind of reorganize some of the stuff in the house. And at the same time, I am preparing for my uh, interview uh, this Friday uh, for my new position uh, that involves a pretty in-depth kind of, I got to watch a bunch of teachers teach on video and prepare feedback for them. So it'll be some live video chats with other people watching me giving that feedback. So uh, I'm, I, I'm kind of physically getting prepared for that in terms of like, you know, I'm taking notes and like, you know, what am I going to say? How am I going to respond if they respond a certain way? Uh, trying to think through all the possible iterations of what could happen, but also, can I give you some advice? Yeah, go. Do you get the videos ahead of time or no? Yes. I, well, not all of them. I, I have one of them. Now they'll give me one in the moment. Look at the videos, write down what you're going to say and actually practice saying it out loud. Okay. Make sure you do that last part. Okay. Yeah, my uh, it, it really helps. I I literally have written myself a script. So, I have a a thing that says me and then what I'm going to say and then I have the uh, response and then I kind of wrote out like two or three prob like possible or probable responses and then what would my response to that be? Uh so you're saying literally pr like should I when I when I practice it should I be playing both parts? Yeah, you could, but make sure you actually say what you're going to say out loud. Like, actually speak the words. When I actually do that, when I take the time to really do that before a presentation, it really helps me. Well, yeah, but that's that's kind of the state of me right now. I'm just a little stressed, but, you know, uh, I, I do well with multitasking. I'm able to kind of, like, divide my time pretty well. But, yeah, no, that's going, everything's going pretty well over here. How about you? How are you doing? I'm good. Nothing's going on. I feel a little unmotivated, lazy, tired, like I'm not getting enough done, but I always feel like I'm not getting enough done. So I don't know, maybe it's just winter time, dead of winter this time of year, but honestly, nothing is going on, which I'm cool with. I'm happy. I'm hanging out with people. I'm getting outside. I'm doing things, but like nothing's going on. You know what I mean? I almost want to like cause some trouble just to have something to talk about. Do you think that's a good idea? <laughs> I think that's a terrible idea. <laughs> I think that's an awful, awful idea. <laughs> I actually, they, I see that fairly often in a classroom when a kid is really, really bored and they kind of start poking at someone to get a reaction. And I'm like, I'll literally lean over to somebody and be like, uh, you need to stop that because I see what you're doing. And they'll look at me like, <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah, Keith, uh, don't, don't poke the bear to see what happens because 99% okay. of the time the reaction is not good. <laughs> right. But, uh, with, this is my, this has always been my personal feeling when I talk to you, no news is good news. Yeah. 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 I, I, I've, I, that's been my consistent, if I come to you and I go, what's going on? And I get the like hard exhale <laughs> before you start talking. I'm like, oh no. Something's, Something's going, on. going on. Like, let's start talking. Let's spit it out because we got to talk about it because that's how things get better. But yeah, I'm glad to hear that, dude. And I'm glad to hear you're spending time with people. I wish I was spending time with people too. 
I mean, you're going to have to visit up here when it gets warm. I can't wait. I have, to, I, you have I, to. I have to. I know he's announced it on Facebook, but a, a good friend of the show is having a uh, another child. What? Gary Shaw is going to have a fourth Shawsome. Are you serious? I swear to goodness. Like he needs another kid? <laughs> he, you know how busy he must be? I, I imagine his life is semi-chaotic. Uh, Whoa. But adding a, adding a fourth Shaw to the world, I say... Bring them on. I think Shaws are good people. We need more of them. He's really good at the family stuff, so I think I think they're going to be just fine. I agree. Listen, folks, we hope you enjoyed the Walter interview. Thank you again, Walter, for coming on the show. That was fantastic. And I'm just going to beg you one more time. Number one, Apple Podcast Reviews. Number two, Spotify Reviews. Just click the five-star button. Just do it. And number three, order the shirt. It's a great shirt. It's a nice shirt. It's a wonderful shirt. Deathwishinc.com store. Search the new scene. Get the shirt. Do it. Done. Finished. Thank you. All right, so that's it for this episode. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And until next time. Yay!